it's, uh, you may have heard a rumor that it might rain today, but don't believe it. It's supposed to be 70 out there, and you don't want to miss that boat ride. Uh, I just wanted to introduce uh, Bill Moeller, who will introduce our speaker this morning. Uh, I think many of you have met Bill uh, as a participant in the conference, but I wanted to mention that uh, Bill's in a new role at Florida State University <laughs> as the director of our community service program, and uh, that that position is a result of a, a task force, university task force, that we uh, had over the past year or so that looked at the whole area of uh, service on campus, and one of the recommendations was that we establish a position uh, for community service, and um, Bill is uh, filling that position very ably. So I'm very pleased to recognize him and have him introduce our speaker this morning, Bill. Thanks, John, and good morning. I hope uh, that your rooms were a little warmer last night than I heard they were the night before. I guess one of the benefits of being a local is I get to go home to my own toasty place. For, for the, getting up on those tile floors, I guess, is a little bit of a treat. It's really a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Susan Stroud this morning, particularly, I guess, since uh, our office enjoys two grants from the corporation at this time, and so it's nice to be able to stand up here and, and say thank you and the chance to repay in some small way uh, for the privilege of being able to spend the federal government's money on the good things that we're trying to accomplish. We've had uh, a wonderful opportunity to visit with Susan during the couple days she's been here. We're really privileged that she could join us and spend so much time with us. She's been introduced before, and many of you have had a chance to talk with her, but I would like to say just a word or two uh, about Susan. Many of you are familiar from sports lore about the term triple threat. Well, Susan's a four-way threat with regard to community service and service learning, and that's really important in terms of the perspectives that she'll bring to us today. First of all, she was a public school teacher in Massachusetts. And as we recall from our conversation with Ben Barber yesterday, if it doesn't begin in the home, it certainly begins in the school system at that level. And uh, that's a very, very important uh, perspective to have for this whole notion of community service and role model. And then from there, Susan went on to Brown University, where she was the founder and director of the Square Center for Public Service. And so, indeed, she brings that higher education perspective, which she shared with many of you in the room. And then as the uh, director of Campus Compact, the premier organization, I would say, for those of us who receive guidance and vision and technical assistance regarding service matters, uh, Susan brings a sort of supra-organizational uh, perspective, uh, that national perspective, and uh, knows very well what's going on on other campuses and around the country. And then last and certainly not least is her, uh, her new uh, role in the federal structure uh, in the office of the White House uh, assistant to the president, and now with the corporation as an executive and advisor, uh, working with Eli Siegel on the, uh, the new legislation, which of course is the, the landmark of legislation for service and service learning in our country now. And so we're really privileged that Susan would bring such a wide and diverse perspective to us and we can, can profit from all that, uh, that background. Now speaking of the corporation, um, and in keeping with what is sort of a down-home theme, the, the staff has been very good in making, I think, everybody feel sort of at home, <coughs> part of our southern hospitality here. And so I have a little uh, gift for you this morning just to make you feel a little more at home. Many of you may know that Eli Siegel was the uh, founder and publisher of Games Magazine, and uh, just so uh, Susan doesn't feel too out of touch uh, with her boss, uh, I brought you a copy for the claim to come back. So, you can tell him that you, uh, you haven't seen that one yet. Okay, so with no further ado, let me bring you Susan Stroud. familiar with uh, Art Schlesinger's book, Cycles of American History. 
but it really is the very best description, I think, of the cyclical nature of public and private periods of public and private concern uh, that stretch back way into the 18th century in American life. It's, it's, it's not a new phenomenon. Um, Arthur Schlesinger and his father both uh, did extensive research on, on this issue of uh, cycles in American history. So where I'd like to think that we are all unique in having sort of seized the moment uh, that we have now in, in really beginning to uh, put together a national service structure for the country, uh, I think in fact it's just sort of predestined. We are on the cusp again of a new cycle of, uh, of public, strong public interest in this, uh, in this country. If you think back over 30 years, you'll see that there's a kind, kind of uh, repetition in it. Uh, President Clinton was very aware that he signed the na new national service legislation 32 years to the day that the Peace Corps legislation was signed. And so there, there really is a, a, a rhythm in this. I think that um, when uh, Art Levine went on to say that he, he characterized the current situation as a transition we're in a transition period from a, a long period of, um, of private concern, again, to a, a period of public concern. And I think President Clinton is simply capturing that moment. He felt it. He said when he went across the country during the campaign, he felt a need on the part of people to reach out and begin to rebuild the country. And so I think he, he realizes that he is not inventing national service, that he is building on something that has been in place in this country by instinct for a long time. And he simply has the opportunity to build on the efforts, particularly in the last 10 years that have been growing in national service. In some respects, in reaction that the movement began in this current cycle, I think about 10 years ago, um, I know from my work with the Campus Compact, which, was a, which is a coalition of universities, now about 400. But when we started this, uh, this effort with higher education about 10 years ago, in part it was because we were being told, you, you might remember Secretary Bill Bennett at one point standing up and making a statement before the press that all that American students were, university students were interested in were Florida vacations and stereos. And the presidents that I was working with at the time said, hey, that's not the truth. Uh, and for two reasons. If that became the image that lodged in the public's mind, we were in trouble in terms of the kind of support we were going to get for higher education. Um, and, that, and this was the Secretary of Education talking about. It was creating this image of American university students as only being, as being totally self-interested. That had very dangerous public policy implications. But it also wasn't the truth. Uh, and so I think one of the reasons the compact, one of the impetuses for the formation of the compact was a reaction against that kind of, uh, that kind of feeling that was, uh, that was out there and being portrayed. I think at the same time, 10 years ago approximately, the compact got started, an organization called COOL got started. There was an enormous expansion in youth service corps. Uh, about 10 years ago, there might have been 10 the California Conservation Corps, some other ones. There are now close to 100 of those around the country, probably a little more than 100. Uh, there began a big expansion of service learning in uh, schools yesterday on the panel. I mentioned that Atlanta, Detroit, and some other major public school systems have begun to incorporate service learning. So that's all has been building in, in the last 10 years. So I think when President Clinton came to this, he simply realized he had the opportunity to build on something that had been growing and that was really tapping in to the best instincts in, in the American public. Uh, and I think part of his genius was in recognizing that and saying that he wanted the federal government. Now was the opportunity for the federal government to play a role in what had been growing as a kind of grassroots network of organizations. Uh, the issue of cycles always uh, uh, always worries me a little bit because it implies that there's going to be a peak and then a decline. And, and so what I worry about is, what is the window of opportunity we have here? How many years will we have it for? And how can we build, how can we plan, how can we build so that we don't just become the blip on the screen 
in the early 1990s where service was once again an important issue and then kind of falls off the screen. Jim yesterday said, you know, service is a fad. In the sense that we're at this site where it's, it's part of the cyclical phenomenon, I think that's right. The issue for us as educators who are concerned about this on our institutions is how do we begin to build this in so that it resists the, uh, the tides, the cyclical tides of, uh, of change that are inevitable. Uh, what kinds of institutional structures do we have um, to help uh, uh, mitigate the, the kind of changing nature of this? Well, let me turn to uh, President Clinton's ideas about this for a minute. One of the strongest themes you might remember from the campaign was a theme ran through a lot of issues. Uh, he refers to it as rights and responsibilities. Uh, it's the twinning of those ideas. One has rights, and with rights come an equal measure of responsibility. <coughs> and he talked about that in the campaign. If you read campaign documents like Putting People First, or the DLC's document, Mandate for Change. These are the, the documents that really spell out the uh, kind of philosophical approach to, um, uh, to the Clinton campaign. And what we've seen since he took office was ways in which he's carried forth those, forward those ideas about rights and responsibilities into uh, legislation that he's proposed. The rights and responsibilities, particularly what you see in, in national service. If one does service, sort of in a GI Bill model, if you do service, you get educational awards. Um, welfare reform will support you on welfare, we expect you to work. Um, so it's a kind of rights and responsibilities that carries through a lot, of, very strong in the campaign, carries through in his approach now as he sends legislation up to the Hill. Another theme was rebuilding community. And you see it throughout the campaign, and now you see it throughout his proposed legislation. Um, enterprise zones legislation is one rebuilding community um, piece of work that, that is uh, just going forward now. And I, I think that national service really bridges those two themes or combines those two themes in important ways. Clearly, rights and responsibilities uh, is a big part of the national service program and rebuilding community. That is, the impact that national service will have will be primarily in helping to rebuild communities. So in a sense, national service is, is really the bridge between those two um, major themes. Now, Clinton appointed uh, Eli Siegel, who Bill mentioned earlier, uh, who was to, to head the national service program. Eli is uh, uh, my boss. Uh, assistant to the president. He was the manager of the campaign. Uh, so he's very close, has been a personal friend of, of President Clinton's for more than 30 years. Uh, president Clinton said the other day, I've known Eli more than half my life. So he put in charge of, uh, of the National Service Program one of his most trusted friends and advisors. Um, in fact, the person who ran the campaign for him. And he asked Eli to prepare legislation to go up to the Hill within 100 days of taking office. So that put a little pressure on us. We had to start from scratch, drafting a bill, get it up to Congress within 100 days of uh, January 20th. We missed it by two weeks. We, we didn't uh, get it up there in 100 days. But, but we came pretty close. Um, he said he wanted it to be the first thing out of the block. He wanted uh, it. He talks about it as one of the four cornerstones of his uh, of his administration. He has met with members of his cabinet on at least three occasions and said that national service is not just a program that Eli Siegel is going to run. National service is going to be a new way for us to do business in government. You've got to find ways to involve citizens in solving the problems of these communities. Federal government cannot do it alone. We have to do it in combination with people willing to take on the problems in their communities. So it, it's, it's more than just a program. I think that's very important to, to understand. It's very much more than a program. <coughs> the bill passed uh, the Congress with strong bipartisan <coughs> support in record time. And the President signed the bill. Uh, 
on September 21st. I want to show you some clips of, uh, that's what we've got on tape here, some clips of the President's remarks at the signing of the bill, but I want to just explain to you a little bit about that occasion. Um, um, it was on the south lawn of the White House. We invited about 2,000 people, put up a big tent because it was a, a rainy day. And uh, he invite, we invited about 100 young people to uh, be there with the president on the stage. And the president used um, the uh, pen, he used two pens in signing the bill. One was the pen that uh, Franklin Roosevelt used in signing the CCC legislation, and the other was the pen that John Kennedy used in signing the Peace Corps legislation. So in a sense, he was trying to make the point that this is, this is and you'll notice that those occasions were sort of 30 years apart. Um, that uh, he's making the he's making the strong point that these things are are connected in our history. It was a very moving experience because for me it was uh, it was like bringing the last ten years of my life together at that at that one place in that one moment. It was uh, it was very exciting. So let me just show you this tape. It, it was about twenty minutes worth of comments, which we've reduced to about three and a half minutes on tape of uh, of things that he said. desire 
to bring the American community back together. Thanks to the generosity of Sergeant Schreiber, I will also use the pen President Kennedy used 30 years ago, 32 years ago, to sign the Peace Corps legislation to create a new National Service Corps for America. We will call it AmeriCorps. When I ask our country's young people to give something back to our country through grassroots service, they responded with thousands. You heard a couple of them here today. Eli's office was literally swamped with letters asking to serve. These two young people today represent 20,000 young people next year and 100,000 young people three years from now. And I hope, believe, and dream that national service will remain throughout the life of America, not a series of promises, but a series of challenges across all the generations and all walks of life to help us to rebuild our troubled but wonderful land. I hope that someday the success of this program will make it possible for every young American who wishes to serve and earn credit against a college education or other kinds of education and training to do that. And I believe it will happen. This morning, our cabinet and the heads of our federal agencies were directed to redouble their efforts to use service, community grassroots service, to accomplish their fundamental missions. We want them to help reinvent our government to do more and cost less by creating new ways for citizens to fulfill the mission of the public. We believe we can do that. Already, departments have enlisted young people and not so young people to do everything from flood cleanup to housing rehabilitation, from being tour guides in our national parks to being teachers' aides in our schools. In the coming months, we will also challenge states and nonprofit organizations to compete for AmeriCorps volunteers. We'll ask our friends in higher education, in the foundation world, and in business to continue their leadership in the growing movement of national service. But beyond the concrete achievements of AmeriCorps, beyond the expanded educational opportunities, those achievements were earned. National service, I hope and pray, will help us to strengthen the cords that bind us together as a people. Will help us to remember in the quiet of every night that what each of us can become is to some extent determined by whether all of us can become what God needs to be. Let me show you how that, um, how that will happen. It'll help to explain, I think, the, 
various programs that are part of the corporation. Some of them are programs operated directly by the corporation, by the federal government, like VISTA. And then others are grants programs. And it's a, it's a little bit confusing, but I hope I can, uh, can show you what I mean. This is the uh, corporation structure. And this is the timeline that I was talking about. We have a, a program to support service learning in schools. It's called Learn and Serve America. And it has both a K-12 and a higher ed component. And um, that is a, a grants program. That's grants to states to support service learning in schools. And there's a, a higher ed component. And this is also a grants <coughs> program. The corporation will give grants directly to colleges and universities or consortia of colleges and universities to support community service and service learning on college campuses. Um, and then there is the, uh, what we're calling the National Senior Volunteer Corps. Some of you may know about those programs that existed uh, under action, like foster grandparents, RSVP, um, those are programs that will continue to exist. So it's really there's the continuum that I was talking about. And in addition, we have uh, the VISTA program that will continue. It's now enrolls about 6,500 uh, people a year in VISTA. And then there's AmeriCorps. And that takes people as young as typically 17, although it can be 16 uh, in certain circumstances, and with no age cap on it at all. Anyone can participate in AmeriCorps with no, no cap on it. Although we expect that most of the participants will be will be younger. Those are the very, those are the and then we have a, another program called the National Civilian Community Tour. Uh, which is a small program which will enroll about a thousand uh, young people. It was a way of, uh, was passed by Congress last year in somewhat separate legislation that they've given to the corporation to run. It's, it will respond to the downsizing of military. Of military. It's a way to use military facilities and retired, and, uh, retired military personnel to work with young people in community service programs. So that's called the NCCC. National Civilian Community Corps obviously builds on the one CCC connection. Um, AmeriCorps this year we have an appropriation from Congress and uh, we um, have uh, enough funds to put out in the field this year 20,000 AmeriCorps participants. Now in some respects you can see that it's either too small a number or too large a number. Um, in some ways it was President was criticized for reducing the uh, original number that he had wanted and proposed, and it was reduced in the course of getting our bill through Congress. It was reduced to 20,000. On the other hand, since our team is responsible, the office is responsible for getting 20,000 people out in the field, we're pretty overwhelmed with the prospect of having to do that. Obligate the funds between by September of 1994 that will put 20,000 people uh, out in the field. At its very peak, the Peace Corps had between 15 and 16,000 people. That's the largest it ever, it ever got. And in the first year, we're putting out more people than the Peace Corps ever had at its greatest. So I'm not, we're not unhappy at the office that we only have 20,000 people uh, to put out there. Next year, if we do a good job and if Congress appropriates funds on the schedule that we have that we have in the authorization um, will it'll grow from 20,000 this year to 33,000 next year and 47,000 the year after that so you can see that the, the growth curve is, is, a, is a bit like this uh, and that's also daunting uh, for us it means we've got to find a lot of organizations have the capacity to organize programs to usefully employ AmeriCorps participants in getting things done in their communities.
Um, so that's the kind of growth that we're expecting over the next uh, couple of years. Corporation has three objectives. Let me just tell you what those are real quickly. The first objective is obviously, how are we going to place 20,000 volunteer AmeriCorps participants? Um, so that's our, that's our first objective, is finding useful work in communities uh, for 20,000. The second ob objective is to build the infrastructure to support that. Um, and that involves a lot of things, training, technical assistance, uh, all of the things to support that, that we need in, in a system to support not only the 20,000, but the expansion of that to 100,000 over three years. And the third objective is to increase the ethic of service um, throughout the country, a modest objective. Um, but that's where we come, that's, that's where our work with schools, colleges and universities, the federal government, uh, and I go back to this comment I made earlier, and you heard the president make in his remarks, that he's instructed his cabinet to really think about ways in which service can be seen as a way of getting their work done. So that's growing the ethic uh, as our third objective. There are three impacts that we would like to have. Um, the first impact is, uh, has become our mantra at the, uh, at the corporation, and that is getting things done. We want to see real impact in the community, um, work that's demonstrable, and uh, and in fairly short order. I mean, th this is this is this is to be about really getting things done. The second impact that we um, that we are interested in is the uh, impact on the participants. How does this change the, the participants? How does it increase the, the? This is where the civic education piece comes in. Does does participation in AmeriCorps for a year or two? Uh, result in any change in the way that people see themselves in society. And then the third impact is strengthening the community, rebuilding community. And that's where the president talks about uh, strengthening the cords that bind us together as a people. We really want the, one of the impacts of AmeriCorps to be bringing people together from across all kinds of, of lines to work together in improving their communities. There are several principles that most of our work will be, all of our work will be based on. This is about solving community needs, and therefore it really has to be a bottom-up effort. It's got to be community-based and community-driven. Another principle is diversity. The president wants this program to look like the face of America, as he describes it. And we're talking about diversity of all kinds, not just uh, racial and ethnic diversity, but age. We're very interested in intergenerational programs, for instance. Uh, we want to engage people with all kinds of disabilities. That's another important priority for us. We really, we really do think that this is an opportunity for everyone to be involved, and that will be a, a high, uh, a, a, an important criteria for us in judging programs. And the other is uh, direct impact. We really want programs that are going to have a direct impact in the community. We want participants working in direct ways in service. Every nonprofit organization can use fundraisers and clerical assistance, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're really talking about people being out working in the community. A lot of community policing organizations have come to us and said, you know, if we could get AmeriCorps participants to come in and help us with the paperwork in the office, we could put more cops on the beach if we didn't have to have our professional police sitting in the office doing all this stuff. So we'd like all your AmeriCorps participants to come and, and basically staff our precinct offices so that we can, get, uh, we can get more people out there doing community policing. That's not what we're about. We're really about involving people very directly in the community. So that's going to be a, 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 another priority of ours. The statute lays out four areas of need where AmeriCorps participants will be working. We're working to improve education, health and human needs, the environment, and public safety. So all of the programs will be in those four areas. And those are very broad areas, of course. Uh, and we've defined them somewhat more in the materials that we, um, that we have. So how 
all the funding for the program flow. There are basically three equal pots of funding. Um, the legislation requires <coughs> the state to establish a commission appointed by the governor, must be bipartisan, must have representation from various constituencies like youth, labor, business, youth organizations, and so on. And two-thirds of the funding will flow through these state commissions. One-third of the funds will be granted directly by the corporation. Now, of the two-thirds from the corporation that goes through the states, one-third is going to go out basically on a population formula. The states have to prepare strategic plans and present those plans to the corporation. Assuming that they've presented a reasonable plan, the first third will go to the states on a population basis. So if every state does a reasonable plan, every state will get some plan. <coughs> the second third, which also goes to the states, goes to the states but on a competitive basis. All the states will have to compete their best ideas and will will award the second third to the states on a competitive basis. The third third goes from the corporation directly, and that is uh, for organizations that are, for instance, large nonprofit organizations that might be working in various states. So um, if the American Red Cross wants to organize a program to have AmeriCorps participants working in the nine states that were reflect, uh, affected in the Midwest by the floods, then uh, that's the kind of proposal that would come to us directly rather than trying to go up through nine state commissions. So there's a way in which we can fund things directly through the corporation that sort of cross over state boundaries. The funding goes to programs, not to individuals. So the programs are funded and the programs then hire participants. Um, and there'll be two ways of hiring participants, a lot of local recruiting, um, and then there will also be a national recruiting system. Uh, so there will be both of those ways. Um, the, uh, let, me, let me talk about what the participant receives. If you are hired as, a as, a, as an AmeriCorps member, what you get during, uh, you get paid a minimum wage stipend while you are working. Uh, you can work for one or two terms um, basically one or two years. You get paid VISTA wages, the, the equivalent of VISTA wages for the time that you're working. You also get health care uh, and child care if you need it as a way of encouraging, um, um, for instance, single mothers to participate in this. And then at the end of your period of service, for each year of service, you receive an educational award of $4,725. This is I'm basically describing the standard model. There's a sort of standard full-time model. It gets much more complicated because there are lots of variations on this. You can serve part-time, uh, you can serve over a certain different numbers of years, and, and so on. But let, let's just keep with the full-time model, and then if you're interested in the part-time options, I can uh, describe those to you as well. The award that you get, the educational award, when you, as a participant, when you are enrolled in a program as an AmeriCorps participant, the educational award is set aside for you in the Treasury Department. And at the conclusion of your service, one or two years, so you could earn up to close to $10,000 by, by uh, spending two years in the program. That is set aside, and you then have seven years to draw down on that, on that money. You needn't spend it immediately, in other words. You can do this service before, during, or after college. So you can graduate from high school. Or in some cases, if you haven't completed high school, have left high school, you can enroll as a AmeriCorps participant, but then you must, you must uh, promise to complete your GED uh, during the course of your service. So before, sir, before, during, and after, or any combination thereof. So you can graduate from uh, high school and do a year or two. Um, you can do it during college, and that might be an option that's of interest to all of you here. Central University, and you can do it after college. Uh, and the awards can be used for any certified education or training program. 
So it isn't just for people who are going on to college. If you don't intend to go to college, you can use it for certified training and apprenticeship programs as well. Full time, we're, we are, just in, we are um, defining full time as 1,700 hours of work over a period between nine and 12 months. Part time, we're defining as 900 hours over two years, or in the case of being enrolled in an institution of higher education, 900 hours over three years, 300 hours a year would be an AmeriCorps program. We're going to expect programs to train participants, both in, in terms of orientation, but then ongoing uh, training, both in skills and in reflection. Um, and we expect them all to be working in one of these priority areas that we've, that we've defined. Now what, so for, for institutions of higher education, there are really a number of opportunities in the corporation funding. One is to apply to be a program for AmeriCorps participants. Uh, if you are Florida State University, you could apply for AmeriCorps participants who would uh, be involved in a program while they are enrolled in college. Or you might apply for uh, to operate a program for students who have graduated from high school but not yet uh, entered university. Or you might put together a program that would have your graduates working for one or two years uh, post-graduation. There's no reason why a university couldn't do all of, those, all of those options. There's also an option for what we're calling a professional core. Um, and that's slightly different. That would allow, we, we have allowed for a lot of flexibility in this, where we have said that you can pay up to 200% of the minimum wage for, to, to attract people with higher skills, for instance, young lawyers, who might want to work in, in public interest positions. You can pay up to 200% of minimum wage. And if you, uh, um, the federal government will only uh, put in 85% of minimum wage, but you're still allowed to be an AmeriCorps program by overpaying that, you simply have to overmatch anything over 85% of minimum wage. Um, so there, there are ways in which there's lots of flexibility, and that's why I say there are a lot of variations uh, on this. I'm, I could go on at length in the details of this program, but I don't know that it would be useful. I think what I'll do is just finish up in a minute and then take your questions, because we might be able to get at uh, what's on your mind um, better that way. Let me just mention two other things of, that the administration is doing to support um, um, national service and civic values. There, within the uh, K-12 system, you might know that the Elementary and Secondary School Act is being reauthorized this year. And the Education Department has put in language about service learning into, that, into the Elementary and Secondary School Act. They have also, as part of the education goals, um, many of you may be familiar with the education goals that have been established, they have put civic education into the education goals and are working um, now to, uh, to figure out how you could decide that those goals were met. Another uh, new initiative is one being organized by Sheldon Hackney at the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, uh, Dr. Hackney is going to be setting up a series of what he's calling National Conversations about Civic Values. Uh, and there, I would think that given the NEH's relationship to universities, that it might be a very good way to tap into some NEH funding for seminars on or to, to sponsor these national conversations uh, on civic values. So I would encourage you to be in touch with the NEH uh, about, they, they're just beginning to, um, I think they just decided to pilot six of these national conversations over the next eight weeks. Uh, and they're going to see how these go and then they're going to, I think, uh, put together a grants program for funds that will be available next year and uh, go forward with a full loan plan. So I, I encourage you to make connections with the NEH if that's appropriate. I want to return to the idea of rebuilding community and what uh, community service can do as a vehicle for that. Ben Barber mentioned that <coughs> citizenship is what we share. <coughs> Cultural and ethnic and other forms of diversity are what celebrate our differences. And I agree with him about that. I think uh, that community service has an opportunity to really build our community, bring, bring together people on our campuses across lines um, that we, that, 
in ways that we don't normally do. My experience at Brown, for instance, is that um, community service was one of the few places on campuses where we really saw students from different ethnic and racial backgrounds working together. And in part, I think it was because they were able to define some kind of common purpose outside their differences and it allowed them to work together in important ways. I know, for instance, on our campus, if we had to organize another black Jewish student dialogue, I mean, please, they, how many more of those are you going to get students to come to? But when we got students working together, when we sensed tension and we could put together programs that brought people together to work on something, and in the course of that, reflect on what their community meant, um, the community of the campus, the larger community of which the campus was a part, the, their sub-communities within the campus. It was a very, much more powerful um, experience, I think, than, uh, than a lot of the kind of uh, other vehicles we've tried, like you know, rap sessions and so on. I, I really encourage you to think about community service on your campuses as a way of rebuilding community in important ways. And I want to thank uh, John Dalton for his leadership in putting together this institute for the work of all of you who are working on your campuses and helping to resurface the discussion about values. I think we've been scared off from discussions of values for, for too long, and it's, I think, uh, um, very important that we do this. And I'm glad to see that community service is one of those values that's being explored. So thank you. And I'm happy to answer uh, whatever questions you have about AmeriCorps <coughs> or the corporation. John? Uh, Susan, um, I have a question on how large the grant program is that might go to college and universities. And are there any parameters on the size of the grant you could request? The reason I, the reason I, I want to just mention is that uh, I've been doing a little work with the Council of Independent Colleges by DuPont Circle. Um, they have received a half million dollar <coughs> anonymous gift to set up an institute on community service and volunteerism. And they're just sort of sorting out how that's going to work. And if there's any private colleges here who want to have any affiliation with the Council of Independent Colleges, they're looking for a project. But I was wondering if this if this is the vehicle for say a matching grant where <coughs> CIC does the paperwork, and then the corporation provides a grant so that a number of the 320 colleges in CIC could actually implement. Does that sound like a reasonable scenario, possibly? Yeah. Um, as I say, this, this program, this higher ed yeah. grants program right here, which is separate from AmeriCorps. Oh, it is? OK. Separate from AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. um, this is a $10 million grants program. And it funds universities or colleges, or consortia of universities or colleges. So whereas CIC might be a consortium, yeah, it is. then, okay. then it, it yeah. might fund CIC. And if it were on a matching basis, it would be that much more expensive. And, and is that grant program ready to go now? Yes, we're up and ready to go. And the deadline for applications is uh, April 9th, I think. So, uh, I didn't mention the deadlines that we're on, although I have up here uh, single copies, which I think we could get a uh, copy for you. Um, application deadlines on all of the different programs, including higher ed. Um, higher ed is April 9th. Okay. Thank you. The AmeriCorps proposals, the ones that would come directly to the corporation, those applications are April 15th through the state commissions, the applications are due uh, June 15th. So you can see what kind of a timeline we're working on. It's ridiculous. Nobody would design it this way in the, in the right line, but we're, that's what we're doing. Um, I also have an application request form for anyone who would like to get information. Um, and we've been holding technical assistance meetings about AmeriCorps around the country, and we just completed those. Um, we know we weren't able to reach everybody that way, so we're responding to uh, telephone through the telephone. And they're, um, we're doing that by setting up conference calls around the different programs. And so there's a schedule of conference calls that you can get booked onto if you have questions about, uh, about AmeriCorps. So I'll make all of these available. We can get multiple copies of them.
And then I have about 50 of these um, recent brochures, these recent brochures that we just put out last week. It doesn't explain, it assumes you know something about AmeriCorps, but it has a lot of this uh, technical assistance information and how do you get information, how do you apply, that, that kind of thing. So um, I encourage you to, to uh, why don't I just hand this out? Yes. Yes. What you do is, that by by serving you, you create this account at the treasury, and you can use it either for you can use it to uh, to uh, pay off loans, or as a scholarship for you know for future educational costs. It can go either way. You graduate with, from Brown with a certain amount of debt. You can use it to simply buy off those loans, or you can use it to go to graduate to graduate school. So you can use it in any combination. Right, the ten million dollars. This grant program, no relation to the state commission. This grant program is directly to the corporation. Okay, and what you want to do is get the uh, get the guidelines on that um, from the corporation. Yes. Loans are deferred while you're serving. Mm -hmm. There should be no burden on the financial aid offices at universities for doing this at all. The uh, programs don't actually get the educational rewards. <coughs> the grants the corporation makes will be for participant costs and program costs. The educational awards will be set aside as a separate pot of funding. So that the, and, the, and the participant never actually sees that money. That money, they can, you know, if you graduate, and you want to, and you want to serve for a year, and then you want to uh, repay your debt. You simply let the corporation know which financial institution to send the check to. So there shouldn't be any burden on the financial aid offices. Yes. Do you have any idea what the status is of the state commissions? Do most states have commissions at this point. Is there a deadline by which they have to happen? Yes, February first was the deadline. We expected uh, uh, information from each of the governors by February 1st and their intention to um, to establish a commission okay. um, to establish a commission by February 1st and we heard from 48 of the 50 governors so there are various stages of development I know in Florida uh, Governor Childs has already appointed the commission and that's happened in several other states in other states they are um, not as far along and we have a, a, a main contact for each state in the back of that brochure that I just sent around. So if there's any question about who's leading up the effort in your state, you can get that information at the back of that brochure. They have a lot of discretion. The, the question was, what discretion do the state commissions have in how the funds are are, are awarded, and um, they have uh, they have a lot of discretion. In the first third of the funds, it goes out on basically a formula. Um, they we're not applying our priorities very strictly. They can they have more flexibility with those funds. With the second pot that goes out on a competitive basis to the states, we say we have we have uh, uh, we've made it. Um, mandatory that they fund things within our priority areas. So that, you know, in different pots of money, the, there are more restrictions on different pots of funds. Other questions? Yeah. The higher ed grants will be uh, ready to go by fall. I mean, you will be, the winners will be the prize. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. We intend to do the turnaround. The, the application deadline is April 9th. We intend to do the turnaround very quickly on those. So they, those could be funds. But certainly, we would want to obligate those before the end of uh, September. But we are trying to get grants out uh, early in the summer so that there are some programs that could start in September. In principle, yes. Yeah. I think that the corporation is always more interested generally in funding um, new programs rather than existing programs where we'd basically be replacing your dollars with our dollars. So in some sense, they're, they're interested in funding new, new efforts rather than... New programs don't necessarily have dollars involved. Right, yeah. right. I should also say there are two different kinds of grants through AmeriCorps. One is a one-year planning grant so if you have a really good idea, but that there's no way you, know, you would be able to put it into operation, it's going to require building partnerships and so on, there is the possibility of one year planning grant. But if you have a plan that you've been sitting on, ready to hatch, uh, except for lack of funds, um, there are also operating grants. And the operating grants could be, can be up to three years. So you, can, you should really think of uh, one-year planning grants or up to three years of operating funds. Are there parameters for grants and the minimum and the maximum? Yes. Um, well, not, not strictly. I mean, we're saying that we probably don't expect to make very many grants that are of the $4 million <coughs> range. And they 